This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Right, I think everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm sorry for short notice in terms of being able to prepare for this evening's event. We're terribly excited that we do have with us a very distinguished military historian and former Pal Tepak, who's Professor of Military History at the Royal Canadian Military College. And we're enormously grateful to him for talking about a subject that's very dear to his heart and one right upon which he has done an immense amount of work. Uh, namely on the South Atlantic and in particular looking at military strategic uh, options. So he's going to talk to us today about his recent uh, work and thoughts on the present crisis. And uh, I wanted also to say that uh, we're eagerly anticipating the publication of uh, Hal Kupak's next book, which is a military biography of Raoul Castro, which will be coming out very soon uh, in the series that I edit for Isa Palgrave. Uh, so please look out for that and um, we very much hope to have an event organised around uh, the publication of that book in due course. So uh, without uh, too much further ado, I know you're all eager to hear uh, Hal's thoughts on this extremely important question. So let me uh, turn over to you, Hal, to uh, take this forward. Thank, Thank you, Maxine. Um, I'm going to try to talk about this in the context of changes in South America, not just the particular crisis that we face today, but in many ways why this is different from other crises and how that might reflect um, the very, very different situation that I think is being lived in South America and to some extent in Latin America uh, as well. Um, I must say to you, putting my cards on the table uh, uh, right, right away, uh, that it is to me very tragic to be even obliged to think about these things, you know, and from my perspective as a military historian, uh, in many ways the Falklands War says a great deal about these two countries. Uh, I think in many ways it's the last of the uh, gentlemen's wars, if one can still uh, call things uh, by such a title, in the sense that uh, in the many uh, occasions where there could have been barbarisms of the usual kind, I don't have to remind Britons today, of uh, the usual kind in this era. Um, but in the, in the context of, of 1982, what we saw, despite the armed forces in, our, in the Argentine case, uh, very much tainted by the dirty war and by all the negatives of the previous at least seven, six or seven years, the, the fact was that the Argentines, and I'm sure there are people from the Falklands here, uh, and it seemed like a very heavy boot of, of occupation, but in fact, by the standards of any conflict one can find out there since the Second World War, even including the Second World War, both sides conduct themselves with exemplary gentlemanly behavior, if one can um, still refer to war in, in that sense. Um, so that to, uh, I would like to at least congratulate both those countries in the midst of their current squabble, a squabble which I uh, feel will be lasting some time, and is not really a crisis in the sense of a flare-up but much more a new, uh, a new era, again I regret to say, of uh, what I think will be um, uh, the usage of this particular uh, problem as a, as a, a flashpoint um, for many relationships. Um, I also feel that it's worth mentioning that I have been very depressed by the uh, language taken. It seems to me very unfortunate that one should be talking about el uniforme de los conquistadores, uh, in, in a situation like this where two countries have, have such good relations on so many other levels, nor do I think it's useful to talk about colonialism uh, in an Argentine sense. Uh, if, I hope that doesn't get me too many attacks uh, today, nor of speaking of people's stupidity, mediocrity, uh, and as we come to three weeks to the Dia de los Caídos in Argentina, I find it extremely unhelpful as our diplomats uh, would doubtless uh, uh, term it. I also would point out at the very beginning that I'm depressed by the fact that one should immediately be leaping to the idea that these are weak governments desperately in need, in both cases, both London and uh, Buenos Aires, are desperately in need of some kind of thing, flashpoint to which they can rally people around the flag. I think that the situation we're facing is a great deal more com uh, complex uh, than that, as it was in 1982, although perhaps a bit more uh, central uh, then. 
And of course, needless to say, as a very last point, I would say that it's a pity to see that umbrella that was so profitable, I think, to both sides for so long, uh, put over this particular issue, uh, well put away in the last uh, five years, and now are reaching this uh, almost fever pitch, or at least seen in some circles as such. Um, as I said, I'd like to talk about the Argentine essentially raising of this. Britain isn't raising this. Uh, Argentina is, is uh, raising this and uh, bringing it to, uh, to a much uh, higher pitch in, in recent years, and particularly in recent months. Um, but I'd like to, again, speak of it in the context of South America. And the point I would like to make in this talk is that despite the absolutely vast, perhaps the greatest ever, differences along ideological lines that we see among the governments of uh, South America and Latin America more broadly in recent years and currently, it has still been possible, an extraordinary, but possible to build the greatest consensus in South America that we have ever seen. Yes, there are a number of ideologies out there. There are a number of completely contradictory pr projects for the South America and the Latin America one wishes uh, to, to build from right-wing governments in Chile all the way to Venezuela, the whole gamut. Um, at the same time, one sees uh, an ability for those countries on the practical matters of integration and profiting from integration, political cooperation, economic integration, uh, and in many ways defense uh, cooperation at levels never seen before, never seen before. Historians aren't supposed to use the word uh, never, um, but I think in this case it would be difficult to prove uh, otherwise. Uh, that this is a remarkable turning point, whether it's going to be central, whether it's going to last, is anybody's guess, but certainly the dynamism in the Americas <coughs> when it comes to cooperation uh, is no longer hemispheric. It's very much uh, regional, sub-regional, and with all that I think uh, one will be able to see um, uh, happen uh, coming out of it, which I think will affect a great deal. Um, this situation, uh, I will suggest, has an enormous impact on this particular um, context that we're talking about of the islands, and uh, much more uh, widely as well. Um, and I'll leave much of it for discussion afterwards, because obviously we're talking about a very large region with a great many states in very different circumstances, but I'll try to um, uh, tackle this by saying what's different about this crisis. Uh, then talking about a bit where both sides stand, uh, but always with them, I hope, the South American and Latin American wider the context. In 1982, as I don't have to say to anyone in this, uh, in this assembly, um, when the Argentines uh, took us all by surprise, including took Argentina by surprise, the military junta uh, moved to uh, seize uh, the Falkland Islands, um, and took a previously divided nation, extremely divided nation, into a level of unity uh, probably rarely seen before uh, by, in, by an attack, an invasion, according to some, uh, of a British <coughs> territory which was about to celebrate its 150th anniversary uh, as a British territory. Uh, in other words, something of very long date, uh, particularly in an, Amer in an American sense, uh, a very long time back in history, uh, these particular islands became British, and of course the British claim goes very much back, back very much farther than that in the 16th century, as does of course the Spanish and then uh, 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 Argentine claim to it. But that the result of that uh, invasion is a considerable, but really hardly impressive range of support among the nations of Latin America. Instead of a ready-I-ready ready approach, such as one found in the Commonwealth, and overall, I think one could say in Europe, some people might quibble uh, with that suggestion, uh, but certainly in the Commonwealth, um, uh, Argentina is not able to garner the kind of support that she would have, uh, would have hoped for uh, across a wide range. She's able a little bit over time, during the several weeks of the crisis, uh, to improve on that, uh, on that score. Uh, but she's not able to uh, right away. And it seems to me that the limitations to Argentina's being able to muster the South American and Latin American um, support uh, are interesting to see because then it's much more marked what we see today in contrast uh, to this. It seems to me that the reason she gets in many cases not even declaratory support, but in no case effective support. <coughs> no case. 
uh, is about history. Argentine difficulties with its neighbors, particularly Chile, but not only Chile, to fears elsewhere of a precedent this sort of action could take. If one were to talk about one of the great quips of, uh, of uh, an American geopolitician about Latin America is that if you put all the conflicting claims to irredentist territory together, it would be larger, that territory would be larger than Latin America itself. Uh, that's, to that degree, one has confusion despite the principles established by the Latin American countries on independence. That is still the level of uh, disagreement that's uh, still there. So that the fears that such a precedent, that the, that the suggestion that one can go back, uh, taking the United Nations Charter is saying, yes, dorénavant, from now on, you can't uh, claim right of conquest. But of course, if one had suggested that right of conquest was not part of international law before 1945, he wouldn't have had much to talk about. That's the way people uh, conducted themselves. And regrettably, I think if we were sanguine about this, uh, we would agree that it's not quite over yet uh, in terms of what military might gets you. So it was not just the obvious um, uh, partners you could imagine that, uh, that Argentina missed out on. Belize, for worries about Guatemala, Guyana, even more dramatically for worries about the Essequibo region and other problems with, with Venezuela. It was not only them, but others who also uh, joined the ranks of those unwilling uh, to even go to declaratory uh, level. There was, of course, Commonwealth solidarity in the Americas as well. All of the nations of the Americas that are members of the British Commonwealth of Nations showed solidarity. In the case of Canada, actual deployment of military resources to free British military resources from the North Atlantic and from NATO to deploy and be replaced by uh, Canadian, um, by Canadian uh, military assets. Um, of course, also playing a role, and I, this is nothing new to anyone here, was the horrific reputation of the regime itself. Uh, that is, that siding with Argentina was extremely difficult uh, to do for many countries who might have had uh, sympathy uh, otherwise, so that while declaratory support might become forthcoming on a great deal, the 1980s were already in the beginnings of uh, the return of democracy, or if you prefer the arrival of democracy uh, in the region, and there is some reluctance, of course, on that mm -hmm. score uh, as well. Um, to, to um, go, come too close. And uh, that would be, of course, the countries like uh, Colombia, which in fact does not until the very end of the conflict come on board, even in a de declaratory fashion, but rather uh, indirectly, at least back to Britain, certainly doesn't back uh, Argentina. And Cuba, which as you might well imagine, wrestles with this problem in dramatic fashion. Uh, given that uh, ideologically this is not exactly the kind of government it is keen to support, uh, but at the same time Latin American solidarity is Latin American solidarity. In the case of Cuba, there's actually a promise of military assistance uh, to uh, Argentina, whether that's tweaking the Americans' eventual uh, nose or something else. We'll have to look at the Cuban archives when they open someday. Um, that initial reaction is not alone. Cuba is not alone in that. Peru also comes in suggesting that it will assist Argentina militarily uh, if it is required uh, to defend itself. And Venezuela's reaction is not quite so strong, but perhaps given again the requirement for, um, for some uh, um, uh, statements along lines that would be of interest on the venezuela Guyana dispute, uh, they, quite, uh, they are reasonably far, uh, forward on these issues as well. None of this direct military assistance actually arrives or is dispatched or is even organized by anyone. There is no military support of any kind uh, coming to um, Argentina. She's on her own. Um, Brazil and Uruguay, who one might imagine Brazil uh, as being engaged. In fact, the Royal Navy uh, ship that sails to seize the Falklands in 1833 is using a little-known Royal Navy base in a place called Rio de Janeiro, uh, something that is not widely uh, spoken of in South American circles for reasons one can uh, easily imagine. But in fact, uh, it then sails back to Rio de Janeiro, having uh, uh, seized the islands from uh, what passes for settlement. Uh, in, some, in some quarters. Needless to say, the exceptions in terms of the super keen 
were Guatemala and El Salvador, where the Argentines had a significant mission teaching, well, you can call it, I think the current phrase is enhanced interrogation techniques. I believe that is the current Guantanamo uh, expression. Uh, but teaching uh, advanced interrogation techniques and other counterinsurgency uh, uh, training is being given by a significant uh, Argentine military mission uh, in Central America, largely in Guatemala, but also in El Salvador. Those two governments stepped forward to the plate in very dramatic fashion in support of, uh, of uh, Argentina until such time as the United States comes in uh, on Britain's side. When that occurs, of course, those countries entirely dependent on the United States assistance, particularly at that time, uh, pull in their horns dramatically and remain extremely declaratory in what they say uh, from then on. Uh, and Mexico, of course, as ever, the um, legalist in these things says that while it has enormous sympathy uh, for the Argentine claim, uh, at the same time, the, uh, the use of force uh, to back it was in international law terms absolutely unacceptable. Um, as I mentioned, Argentina was able to garner a bit more support by the end of the struggle, once the British victory is fairly clear. Today, I think the situation could hardly be more different, and it tells us, I think, a great deal about this new Latin America. Um, this time, the whole of the Argentine initiative is diplomatic. There are no deployments of forces. Needless to say, there is no invasion. Uh, there is no bellicose language whatsoever. Uh, there's unpleasant language, certainly, as I was quoting at the beginning from both sides, but there's certainly no bellicose, no, no suggestion of military uh, use or that one would build forces to eventually have that option or anything of the sort. This is very much a diplomatic initiative, a very powerful and well-grounded uh, well one, but nonetheless ex exclusively um, uh, diplomatic. That is surely the, uh, a dramatic element of this. Secondly, and perhaps even more dramatic in some ways, is that we now have an Argentina which is both legitimate actor in international relations, extremely legitimate in international relations, but also with a flourishing democracy, uh, leaving La Nación and various problems with the press uh, being followed by intelligence services. Uh, no one would question that Argentina is a full-fledged uh, democracy, if a recent one uh, at the present time, and the legitimacy that she garners in all circles uh, I think is, is uh, quite uh, obvious uh, in, in, that, uh, in that sense. Um, but much more widely than this, if we go to more concrete elements, I think one can see the, how the situation has changed. Mercosur itself, its existence as an extremely important trading bloc, still far short of some of the objectives of its uh, framers, but nonetheless a linking um, uh, Argentina with uh, other active players, major players, in the case of Brazil on the international scene, a grouping that has uh, associate members, both Chile, very open-minded, of course, open to the world, and Bolivia, with, a, with its own um, interest in, in the expanded uh, integration of Latin America. While one can say all kinds of negative things about progress made to date, uh, no one would suggest that Mercosur is not a significant actor. And Argentina is the number two player. Uh, in it and has been a major motor, not as much a motor as Brazil, obviously, but a major motor in, in its creation. And those countries have shown on a number of thorny diplomatic issues in the past considerable willingness to modify their own uh, diplomatic stances in favor or one or other uh, of uh, their members. Much more dramatic still, of course, and again, no surprise to this audience, is UNASUR, this union of South American nations, which in many ways has captured the headlines in the last couple of years in terms of uh, political cooperation and, uh, and economic moves towards integration, however uh, sketchy and indeed um, left-footed uh, they seem to be uh, on many scores uh, to date. Also interesting, although Argentina is not a member, she certainly has been very willing to engage with ALBA itself, uh, this uh, much more left-wing um, uh, tendency within Latin America with 
another proposal, or perhaps several other proposals, depending on which country, uh, mem member country you're talking uh, about, but a series of proposals for where Latin America, where South America, where the relationship with the United States, where the hemisphere uh, should be going, uh, of a distinct leftist uh, inclination and taking Cuba as at least moral uh, guidepost um, uh, for the future, if not the Cuban economic model as necessarily uh, the most uh, successful one. Again, both UNASUR, particularly UNASUR, but even ALBA have come out on this issue in dramatic fashion, even though in the ALBA case it's not, it doesn't have uh, Argentina as a member at least uh, yet. And those of course remain part of a much wider scope a number of uh, organizations which have been founded in recent years and even in recent months trying to jostle around the issue that in the face of the defeat of an hemispheric uh, free trade arrangement in 2005, uh, the end of NAFTA plus 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 uh, and its replacement by all these very different uh, regional proposals in the Andes, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in NAFTA, in Mercosur, etc., that, uh, that in the midst of all of these, there is tremendous political cooperation as well. Uh, political cooperation which increasingly talks about accepting the facts of the day. What are the facts of the day? North America, the United States of America, has still a dominant position in the Caribbean, in Mexico, in Central America, and to its neighbor in the north. Whereas, with the exception, partial exception of Colombia, the rest of South America has detached itself from that historic, or at least post-World War II, if you prefer, uh, dependency, and seems to be building its own road forward with the idea of the creation, and it would be a creation, but after all, the concept of Latin America is also a creation, in this case, the uh, creation of a South American identity on which all countries, including Guyana, oddly enough, for some, uh, have uh, bought in. Um, this, of course, follows on to Contadora <coughs> and Central America, to the Rio group, but has gone much beyond, uh, beyond it. What is certain in that is that the US, U.S.'s ability to shape events, as it did so dramatically in 1982, is not there, is simply not there. Um, I would like to those talk bilaterally a little bit. We have the end, and it's easy to forget it this many years afterwards, but for well over a century and a half, the strategic balance in Latin America, in South America, was largely a question of Argentine-Brazilian rivalry. And that rivalry was the center of diplomacy, it was the center of arms sales, it was the center of military alliances, it was the center of much in the region. After 1902, I, I don't want to be excessively blunt on this, but essentially Argentina surrenders. Argentina no longer <coughs> opposes itself as a possible rival uh, for Brazil. In nuclear terms, in military terms, in economic terms, of course it's already outclassed. But many of the old arguments that were used about quality over quantity with the Falklands War disappeared in military, diplomatic, and, and other terms. And it was simply um, impossible to continue to suggest that this Argentina of a quarter or a fifth of, a, of Brazil's size could be in a rivalry uh, context uh, with Brazil. And that, of course, is sends um, shockwaves uh, through the series of strategic balances uh, that exist. Peru, Colombia, for example, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina itself. And the second point on that score, I think, is to also say that the Argentine-Chilean uh, rivalry, equally old, one could almost say, although not as dramatic in the early 19th century, uh, that the Argentine-Chilean rivalry is also laid to rest. And lest this sounds like a complaint, I'm, of course, delighted uh, by that trend. This is really very good for peace. It's very good for, for reducing uh, defense budgets. There are all sorts of... Uh, positive things, but obviously for British diplomacy they may uh, have some uh, negative elements here and there. Um, of course, also what happens is the end of the Cold War. The Cold War not only in Latin America, which one could argue was already drawing to a, an end. Um, uh, in the case, uh, this is now the end of the Cold War in the world, 
coming back to having an impact uh, on uh, the region, on the region's defense, on the region's relations. And perhaps the thing least imagined in the context of all of this is an explosion of defense cooperation. For the first 15 years of Mercosur, for the whole of the time of Caritam, in a, in a formal sense, uh, slowly in Central America, although one wouldn't want to be too negative on it, and the Andes hardly at all, defense has been the, 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 the break on political and economic integrative processes. It's been the sec sector of distrust of uh, military worst case planning. Militaries do worst case planning, they don't do best case planning, whereas economics, in at least in economics one hopes that there's something <laughs> best uh, to look towards. Uh, instead of that being the case today, defense cooperation is perhaps the primary source of rapid uh, 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 advance. And I think this also has lessons for us about where uh, British diplomacy and the wider issue of the, of the problem uh, may need to go in the sense that um, we now have uh, a need lacking UNASUR advance on the economic and political front, it has been extremely useful for UNASUR presidents and ministers of defense and foreign ministers to be able to trot out at that great moment when diplomats really need something called announceables at the millions of meetings that as always in Latin America one has to have and sign all sorts of flowery declarations which all reflect in the final analysis acato pero no cumplo uh, that is, I'm, I understand the order, but don't think that I'm actually going to uh, implement it. Uh, of course, this is a, uh, an American thing, an inter-American thing. Uh, let's meet as often as possible, have as much champagne as possible, but most importantly, sign as many agreements as possible, none of which there is even the bureaucratic ability to implement fully, never mind the political will to do so. Did that sound cynical? Uh, uh, um, in any case, that defense cooperation is gaining from the fact that absent a great deal for diplomats and politicians to announce on the political and economic side, the defense side, which was always imagined would be well behind the battleship and the little, uh, the little uh, uh, trawler behind, is now in many senses uh, come to the fore, and we can talk about that as well. This time, the result of all this is that Latin America uh, support has been exceptional. Argentina has succeeded in garnering uh, extraordinary support for its diplomatic claim, based, I would suggest, on all those advances, on all that new positioning that Argentina finds itself in, and for which it has been responsible to some degree, particularly in defense uh, cooperations. Uh, re in a recent article, in a, in a Chilean newspaper, the reference to Chile's position in this, and will not surprise this audience again, was zigzagiar being the only option. That is, we are traditionally a friend of Great Britain. Uh, we are accused of all sorts of naughty things in 1982. Um, we do not wish to have that relationship with Britain important for our navy, important for our commerce, important for our sense of who we are. In, in Chile, we do not want that all ending. At the same time, we have all these agreements, and indeed, for the first time, imaginable in Chilean-Argentine relations, there is actually a joint formation of the two armed forces in place for natural disaster and peacekeeping deployments. Armed, armed forces. This is two armies, navies, and air forces that have spent the last uh, almost two centuries in direct planning for war and nothing else, uh, now with joint units, something which even in Europe is still not entirely in place. Um, and Chile is on board with its reticence and doing its zigzagging, but it has meant that if Chile is in that situation, it doesn't take much of a leap to imagine where others stand. Chile being by far in 1982 the most forward in its support uh, of Great Britain. What has Argentina got so far? Well, uh, regret it or not regret it, it, this is back on the diplomatic table. Um, lots of diplomatic tables. 
and it's not at negotiating table on the bilateral level where it matters, but in terms of just embarrassment, and that's really what we're talking about, uh, it is back on the diplomatic table to some extent as never before, uh, except in the actual crisis of the war. Um, this time, uh, the famous Falklands Ensign uh, denial uh, uh, proposal uh, gets full support, and the Alba Declaration in, uh, supporting the UNASUR Declaration, um, uh, it's even more strident. And all of the quite frightening terms that I suggested earlier on are being bantied about. Uh, there are many things that, uh, whatever one thinks of the Argentine position, the idea that what is currently going on is militarizing the South Atlantic is a stretch of logic uh, that is really quite remarkable. Uh, Great Britain last year had smaller exercise, uh, it has annual exercises in the Falklands as any armed force would in terms of defense of, of national territory, um, but at no level larger than at other times. Uh, the only militarization one can imagine is that that happened after the, uh, after the accusation when of course Britain reinforces uh, with a particular warship it's already uh, uh, deployed uh, elements, military elements. Um, <coughs> and one can imagine, uh, and I stand to be corrected by uh, professionals here in the room, but one could imagine a very long period uh, of time in which this thing will not go to bed. Uh, at the OAS, where I was last week, it was very clear that there are no issues. There was one European uh, 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 union official who was there as a European Union official uh, giving a briefing on something that has absolutely nothing to do uh, with the South Atlantic and the Argentines formally protested to the organizers of the meeting afterwards that he was British and that therefore they should have been advised and they expect to be advised at all future meetings whenever there is a United Kingdom citizen present under whatever you, EU, Commonwealth, or any other uh, flag. This is the kind of thing which is just unpleasant and uh, very spoiling, of course, uh, to a relationship. Um, it seems to me also that it has achieved something which might be even more unpleasant in the long run, at least for those of you who are investors. I'm a professor. I don't have any money but you do, um, and that is, of course, the matter of uh, prospecting for natural gas and oil uh, in the region. Um, there is, of course, a division of views, as I'm sure many of you know on this issue. Um, some people really are quite optimistic, as usual, in these fines, uh, and think this is actually quite manageable and we can more or less go forward relatively soon, and others who don't. What is very clear is that the addition of the political problem to the calculations of uh, firms interested in exploration makes the interest in that particular area of the world as the place to move into less, logically. Why would you go if you can find other places where there isn't, uh, in Alberta or in, uh, off Brazil or wherever? <coughs> Uh, if there's no political factor there, and there's a significant political factor in this one, uh, then that adds simply one more factor. I'm hardly suggesting that that would mean that there would necessarily be no further interest, but prices have to be at a certain level. Uh, depths have to be uh, those that are uh, profitable, etc. Um, it seems to me that Buenos Aires, and I'm, I'm not back, and I haven't been in Buenos Aires during the crisis, but I was there and nobody was talking about much else even before all this uh, blew up in its latest form. Uh, I think Buenos Aires is perfectly aware also that it was in a game, a race against time. I don't want to make that sound too dramatic, but a race against time in the sense that uh, if Argentina uh, watches each time in the old days, let's put, I'll pull myself back on that. In the old days, the chances that anybody would be asking for a visa, asking for a fishing license, or asking for a prospecting for oil license in Falklands was not very great. And 1982, that's changed a tiny bit, but it hasn't changed very much. Uh, 30 years later, of course, fishery licensing 
uh, oil and natural gas prospecting, uh, and visa applications even for tourists or Argentines visiting graves uh, of the fallen, etc. These are daily affairs. And uh, I don't, again, have to tell this audience that that lessens the legitimacy of the Argentine claim every day. Because now it's not just effective occupation of the island since 1833, which is part of the stumbling block, if you look at it from a Buenos Aires perspective, but it's also that there is a continuum <coughs> sealing with crowns and such like of documents uh, that refer to whose the Falcons are. Uh, something which is not obviously seen uh, particularly favorably. And that, of course, we are now talking about celebrating, so to speak, the 180th anniversary. Well, if one sought to, um, in the Americas, to reverse every um, seizure of territory that occurred 180 years back by um, the claims of the injured party at the time, we would be at war for a great deal of the next century, it seems to me. So that there is a question um, that we mustn't let sleeping dogs lie, because those sleeping dogs only appear to be sleeping. There's a lot of ticks and uh, other things running around uh, underneath uh, the hair. Um, it's also fair to, to note, I think, uh, I've noticed, um, and people who are big in Buenos Aires uh, these last couple of weeks maybe could correct me, that politically, as long as one doesn't raise the military issue, this is still a winning issue in the press, uh, in public opinion, uh, in Argentina, particularly as the Dia de los Caídos comes up on the 30th anniversary, the whole question of British, um, uh, from an Argentine perspective, uh, uh, lightness in its approach to what Argentines uh, take very seriously. Uh, this is a popular uh, thing to do. I personally don't think that this government in Buenos Aires is frightened of, uh, of its political context in the way that the government in 1982 was, with strikes and strike, forbidden strikes taking place. Forbidden strikes for a military government uh, are an affront, of course, that they aren't for a civilian government. And when they're, when they're uh, forbidden, uh, it's really quite dramatic when they still take place under a military government. Um, this is something that the government, though, is a win-win if it uh, proceeds uh, in a non-military fashion. I'd like to turn to the armed forces, uh, if I may, and then uh, finish up. And I'd like to start uh, by saying that I think, in the first place, uh, I hope anybody from the MOD will forgive me, uh, but Britain's decision to take the peace dividend to the uh, nth degree and to essentially accept, as the white, uh, successive white papers have suggested, that Britain does not foresee any circumstances in it, which it would conduct major operations uh, abroad except in a coalition uh, context led by probably someone else. I can't imagine that someone else would be. Um, that uh, under those circumstances, uh, it must be said that Britain is very much disarmed compared to 1982. This is a vastly weakened Great Britain with a capability for significant overseas deployment, a fraction of what it was before. That doesn't mean quality is down. Far from it. Just the opposite. In 82, you have a Northern Ireland experienced uh, armed forces with very much different uh, to the ones of today with tremendous experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, which make them I have no doubt can say one of the finest armies in the world, or that it's ever been. But in numbers, terms, and deployable uh, strength in a rapid fashion, uh, very much uh, weakened. At the same time, of course, one has something that one never had in 1982. One has a tripwire. One has a very efficient, uh, continually uh, supplied and supported deployment of United Kingdom military assets on the islands over the islands and around the islands that uh, compares very favorably to a poor old Royal Marine Platoon in 1982. Uh, this is a force which would take real effort to dislodge. It is not a platoon which would be outnumbered, outgunned, out, uh, outmaneuvered instantly as in 1982. Uh, this is a tripwire which would engage Britain uh, immediately if there were 
military adventurism, which I'm sure there will not be. So there can't be a coup de main as there was in uh, 1982, and that can mean at least that one that maybe cooler heads can prevail on some of these uh, issues. Um, in the case of the Argentine armed forces, we also have, but in a much more dramatic fashion, essentially the dismantlement of the armed forces. From the second most prestigious in, Latin, in South America, to the Chileans, who of course are always the best, considered the best, um, you have armed forces which in the first place are a fraction of what they were, were numerically. Secondly, national service is abandoned only a few years later after the war, largely as a result of human rights abuses uh, and, and illness, untreated illness of conscript soldiers, which cause scandals in, in the nation's press. Um, the armed forces have no prestige uh, any longer, but perhaps much more dramatic than not having prestige, because victory can always give you prestige again, and they have very obsolete equipment, ferociously low budgets, weapons that are almost without exception very obsolete, um, and uh, perhaps most uh, dramatic uh, link to all of that, um, they have almost all of the defense budget used for um, uh, pensions, which comes out of the defense budget in Argentina, pensions and salaries. That is to say that operational costs and purchases of new equipment are hardly known. Now this won't surprise you then that while if you're in an Argentine officer's mess and you start talking about military adventurism and the Falklands, you won't get very far. The armed forces are not interested in another adventure of that kind. But they are not mad either. They're perfectly aware that for the first time in decades, there's active discussion in the press and in the nation about rebuilding the armed forces to at least have a military arm of diplomacy. That without at least its existence, one is not taken very seriously in this sad world uh, that Shakespeare describes. Um, the reality is that without military force whatsoever, um, your ability to have punch, uh, no, tent, uh, no uh, pun intended, is, is obviously greatly limited. So they are, of course, pleased that the gesto, the gesture of 1982, is getting even more positive um, press and public uh, treatment in, in recent months and years. Uh, they are pleased with the prestige that at least even defeat uh, brings in terms of heroism and the nation's effort, etc. Uh, they are particularly pleased that there is real debate on whether or not one should rearm within limits. Again, I don't think one needs to be alarmist uh, about this, but as you all know from your studies of history, these ten things tend to get out of hand once they start. And what seems to be a minor uh, effort can then start the ball rolling on pleasant in unpleasant ways. The other point I would like to make is there is no combat experience of any kind achieved since 1982. Whereas the British Armed Forces have been anywhere and everywhere, the uh, Argentine Armed Forces have been nowhere except peacekeeping, which has been particularly effective in terms of junior and CO uh, training. But the other side of perhaps of, uh, of that coin is that they at least know something much more about the world are much more accustomed to working with other de democratic forces, and generally speaking in Argentina, this is being seen as a, as a good thing. But the power, if power projection of Great Britain is less than it was in 1982, Argentine power projection has disappeared. The sea lift and air lift are virtually nil. There are some very old uh, aircraft on the odd runway, but the ability to actually uh, conduct a major operation abroad, even at 480 kilometers, as in the case we see here, uh, it would really be very taxing indeed. Support ships in the Navy are old and few, and the air transport fleet is in very, very bad shape indeed. Well, the reason I talked a bit about the military is that every headline I see in London seems to be, can we still defend the Falklands, which I think is a very unfortunate uh, way of looking at this. Argentina is not talking about attacking the Falklands, but perhaps more worrying still for diplomats in some senses 
is that she finds herself in a very, very different situation, partially of her making. I don't think we should be surprised to see that Argentina is hosting left, right, and center um, uh, political cooperation meetings. Largely at a sort of level that it's Argentina that's bankrolled the Consejo de Defense, or the uh, Defense Council, and that it's Argentina which has largely bankrolled the meetings of ministers of defense and vice ministers of defense, which are very frequent in, indeed among the UNASUR meetings. It appears to be Argentine, uh, Argentine initiatives which have uh, uh, made some of Venezuela's overtures to Guyana in recent weeks, Guyana being a very central player potentially in all of this because it's the only Commonwealth country which is also an UNASUR member. So it at least knows what's going on at those meetings in a way which is uh, is potentially interesting, I would have thought, from, from London's perspective. Other people will correct me in this room, I'm sure, if I'm wrong, which I may well be. But there's a lot out there happening, and Argentina has not been a quiet receiver of these trends, movement in their direction. They have been a stimulant, an active stimulant, under people like, I think, Arturo Forti at the, uh, at the Defense Minister Ministry, one of the few individuals who's permanent, absolutely permanent, absolutely civilian, and has a family axe to ground, grind on this issue, uh, and, uh, and some also in the Foreign Ministry who sense that this is a very, very important issue which Argentina can use in the long term, steadily, and continue to embarrass Britain and embarrass Britain, force Britain to reply to all of these statements which will continue to be made uh, at all of these meetings, at all of these levels, and can make things uncomfortable uh, for uh, Great Britain. This, I think, given our new South America, which I finished, our new Latin America, I think is very interesting. I don't think that it's because there is suddenly great love across Latin America for Argentina. Argent I remember one comment that uh, said if Che hadn't had a Argentine accent, Bolivia would have been communist the next year. And obviously an exaggeration, but you know what I mean uh, when Argentines uh, go around the region. This is of course being replaced rapidly by the Brazilians, we are told in some circles, but that's another story. I was horrified to see that there's now a book on Chilean uh, uh, pride not just the usual ones that are produced everywhere about uh, Porteño or, um, or Argentine pride. But this is a region which is coming through very interestingly at the moment. Strategic minerals, the sales pitch towards, a successful towards China, India, and how many others. This is a region very rich in strategic minerals and very rich in minerals as well. It has relatively successful agriculture in many places and many other places. It's moving along rapidly in that direction uh, in a world where food prices are, are going up. It is remarkably successful, many of its countries, one wouldn't want to exaggerate this, in the question of accumulation of reserves and now using those reserves to support fiscal policy and other policies of, uh, of sustaining employment uh, and the like in the current crisis. It is very easy to continue to dismiss Latin America as a region which it certainly is of enormous inequalities and ferocious poverty and unacceptable levels of uh, political corruption and all the litany and the list of one could make. But at the same time, it's not the old Latin America. And it is splitting ideologically, it is splitting geographically between uh, North and South, but its new elements show remarkable dynamism. And the degree to which Argentina is able to play in that may be a very interesting one for Britain, for Europe, and for all of us. Thank you very much. especially for putting the, the current dispute in a very different and interesting and enlightening context for us, and particularly by focusing on the role of Argentina in the new Latin America. i just kick off with one quick question. I mean, what, given that the British government has been making quite 
serious efforts to develop relations with Latin American governments uh, to make up, it has to be said, for a long period of neglect. Uh, how far do you think this uh, current dispute will, uh, will sort of impede those efforts? Gosh, <laughs> asking a historian about the future. I, know. Uh, um, I think that uh, it's, it's very much in the air. There is still I think tremendous reluctance. If it's taken how many generations to even begin to sell the idea of Latino America, even in the peacekeeping operation in Haiti, great success, all of Latin America virtually together working. If you talk to a Chilean or, or a Guatemalan soldier on the ground and say, are you proud of being part of a Latin American uh, initiative like this? His reaction is, is this a Latin American initiative as well? I mean, armies are national uh, by, their, by their very nature. I think that there's a long, long road ahead. This is very, very new, the idea of South America. And to what extent it's going to anchor itself, I think we're only at the beginning. But I do believe that the declaratory side can take a practical element in the short term, never mind the middle term, that one is always answering. Um, and, uh, and, and the Argentines are not going to let up on that. They, they, and what, and you, you couldn't expect them to. They see, they see this as a remarkably successful initiative so far. They do not see themselves as being behind the gun or, or in great trouble. They, they're, they're flexing their muscles because they feel they have them uh, for once on the diplomatic front. So I think it will be an irritant. I don't think it's not going to be an irritant, but I do think that we'll have to see how far it actually plays out. Chile wants its relationship with Britain and it wants its relationship with Europe. Brazil is not about to sacrifice if there's real European solidarity and even Commonwealth solidarity. It's not going to sacrifice major issues for these two little islands or these, this group of islands. Um, so my suspicion as a cynical historian would be we're still a long way from Britain being halted in its attempt to build new bridges and, and, uh, and, and this highly laudable uh, current attempt to, uh, to, to build Britain back into the region. Um, the region still wants other players. Uh, the United States reputation is not um, pristine. Um, uh, Britain is, is respected. It's appreciated, it's, uh, its position as an English-speaking nation, its links to the Commonwealth, the monarchy. Look at the royal visits that have taken place, it's astounding. A number of, there, are more, there are Camilla buildings in Santiago, in Rio, in Sao Paulo, and there isn't a Camilla building in, in London, I don't think. It's, uh, it, there, there is a desire to have a link with Britain, and through Britain, Europe still, I think, that's uh, still there, uh, and is real. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that it can't be, the pitch can't be a, a little, what do we do with cricket pitches again? Uh, um, uh, you can't queer the pitch uh, entirely from, from, uh, from, from, uh, Argentina, from Argentina, but you can make it uncomfortable. Thank you. Well, let's open up the floor. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Yes? We have a hand right in the middle there. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Matthew Walton. I'm from the MOD. Uh, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will promise not to bite on the issue of what former admirals and generals are saying about this issue at the moment, but I do have a view. Um, I actually want to make a slightly different point, which is um, to say that there are three people in this marriage, and um, Argentina would like to characterize it as like an old colonial issue between one state and the other our side, and, and then on the other. But actually, what they would like to completely put all together is the fact that there are Falkland Islanders, um, who, um, were, they, were there another million of them, would now be an independent country of their own, of their own right. And, uh, um, so, I mean, the way I see it is that Argentina sees it more like a collection of rocks that they, frankly, they want, you see it as belonging to them, whereas the UK position is actually about self-determination, it's about people. Um, so our argument is about, is about really the people and self-determination are being forward. Whereas Argentina's argument is more about some sort of claim I, I would tend to falsify. 
interested in that respect. Well, uh, my perspective would be partially Canadian. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that the naval attaché here in 1982 tried to suggest to the Argentine government, and the document is very attractive in many scores, he says the British imperialism can be accused of all manner of naughty things. But in the history of the British Empire, Protestant, white, uh, English-speaking, uh, normal citizens have never, in the midst of whatever defeat Britain suffers, never been handed to another country. Never. You think we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years and how many defeats. No British territory has ever been yielded up, never mind to a dictatorship of 1982. Well, I mean, by agreement. But I mean, they would, you wouldn't say they were, excuse the expression, but white, classic, Protestant, uh, English-speaking, etc. If they had been, then it wouldn't, I suspect, have been yielded up, except by them voting that that's what they wanted. Um, so there is no example. And that's what he was arguing. What are the chances that they are going to accept it? And I remember in December of 82 being in Guatemala City, where um, I was speaking to the chief of staff of the army there, not a very nice chap, um, 1982 as you can imagine, uh, and he said, well, all I can say about the crisis is the following. Had Britain not fought for the Falklands, we would have taken Belize. It was not a question of would we have. If the British are not going to fight for 2,300 British people, what are the chances they're going to fight for 140,000 Mayas and, and West Indians? Zero. zero. So we would have simply taken it, as simple as that, there's no question. So I'm not suggesting that I don't have, firstly, a great deal of uh, time for the Falklanders' argument. Um, uh, at the same time, I think we have to keep very much to the fore that this humiliation of 1833 is not generating this problem. The problem is, independence is declared, San Martin's dream, is the Viceroyalty coming out as a new Argentina. That Viceroyalty, from an Argentine perspective, includes southwestern Patagonia, Paraguay, Tarija and Bolivia, eventually Bolivia, and Uruguay and the Falklands. All of these are stripped. All of them are lost. Chilean power blocks them in the southwest, British power seizes, American power first. Remember, the Americans drive the Falkland, the Malvinenses off uh, first. American power uh, drives, the, uh, drives them off, uh, whatever, what are the Falklands, what we are going to call the Falklands. Uh, Paraguay goes for independence, uh, Uruguay goes for independence. But perhaps most humiliating of all, sir, is that Tarija votes to join Bolivia rather than Argentina. I happen to love Bolivia deeply, but to opt for Bolivia in 1823 is a statement about your confidence in the stick-togetherhood, good English, eh, of, the, of the new group of provinces that will be Argentina, which is not very high. And I think that we have to realize that for Argentina, that avalanche couldn't be stopped anywhere, but it in the Falklands, it's an external power. It's somebody else. Uh, nobody really thinks there was a flourishing community in the Falklands. I mean, they were mostly whalers, most of them non-Argentinian. Uh, the governor was a Frenchman. Uh, th this is not a normal part of Argentina. But when it comes as part of an avalanche of disaster, uh, it becomes part of your national psyche of, uh, of getting, getting this disaster behind you and moving forward. And, and I think that particularly on the issue of, uh, of where one goes with, uh, with rights for, um, for exploration and the rest, it may be necessary to reach some kind of compromise at some stage, which does not affect Falklanders' Britishness, but which does say that Britain understands uh, the Argentine psyche uh, on, on this issue, but that we could talk about more over a drink, perhaps. Yeah. Sir. Um, I'm Bud McGurk from the University of Nottingham. Um, I was riveted by your presentation, and I thank you because it was extremely informative, and it certainly brought us very much up to not only the date, the day. 
My question um, is uh, focused on a remark you made in response to Maxine's uh, opening uh, probe. And um, it's when you said that Argentines can be confident that they're making it a very successful um, stance currently. And I think that uh, you persuaded us why that would be your view in your presentation. Therefore, my question is, what do you make of the fact that 17 very prominent uh, Argentine intellectuals and public figures have chosen precisely this moment of perceived success amongst Argentines with this greater international impact than perhaps ever before, precisely to raise certain issues of a deep unease within Argentina and amongst Argentines? Do you find that there's any anomaly here? Or do you think that the danger is already being perceived of an imminent triumphalism far too early? I would almost have expected, out of, this is the new Argentina, as well as the new South America, there is vibrant academic debate, uh, mercifully. There's vibrant public debate, differences in the press. That there are people talking on television that are, without being mobbed as they head out of the studio saying, well, you know, this is about negotiation and a slow process. This is not about me recuperating. And even one chap, I don't know if some of the Argentines uh, saw him, a graduate of um, Oxford, a PhD, uh, who's, who when asked, pero las Malvinas son argentinas, no? I mean, they are, they are Argentine, aren't they? And he replied, Bueno, well, perhaps they should be, but visibly they're not. You know, they're, uh, they, I mean, yes, well, that's, they should be. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons. I'd love to see our flag fly one day. But I cannot say, as an international relations PhD, that they are Argentine. I have to ask British permission to go. I have to get a stamp and I have to get a visa. I mean, they're not Argentine yet. One day they might be. I think there's a flourishing debate about it. One of the encouraging signs, I think, is that we're not, we're not triumphalist yet. I think the diplomats have made some successes, I think, and I'd stand to be corrected by, by Argentines in the room, but it seems to me that this is a much more poised discussion. It is, it's got no lives involved. It's, uh, nobody's going to die over it unless we really go wacky. Um, and that this is something where cooler heads can prevail, and the debate is a real one. And I'm not surprised to see some people talking about that. There's a lot of talk among people who are worried about the armed forces, of course, that if this opens the door to modernization, reestablishment, prestige, etc., is this a good thing? Um, uh, and I don't know. I don't know what I can, what I can really easily add to that, but I, I'm encouraged. Uh, by this, and I think in a way it's natural in a democratic new Argentina to see this, just as it was very would have been very unnatural to have seen it in 1982, or at least you would have ended up six feet under very quickly after <laughs> declaring yourself. Yes. Um, I was in the Falklands about a month ago, and um, I was quite surprised by the attitude of the islanders in that um, they did all want to remain British or possibly become independent one day, but they did want cooperation with and links with South America and, uh, um, generally and Argentina. They did want to talk about you know, <coughs> the fisheries and oil and all sorts of practical matters and have trade links. And my question is really whether, um, uh, irrespective of the sort of merits of the Argentine claim, whether their position at the moment is, is counterproductive in the sense that if they were to have these talks and continue in the vein of the 1990s and cooperate on fishing and have these sort of personal and professional links with the Falkland Islanders, there'd be much more basis for a discussion, a compromise. You might even find the Falkland Islanders moving towards South America of their own accord. Um, but whereas um, the Kirchner government cutting off all links and actually trying to isolate them might be sort of counterproductive to their own um, aims. I think it is actually, but that's not the way it's viewed. Mm. It's viewed as this is right and wrong. These are questions of right or wrong. Uh, that that um, uh, we have tried for well over a hundred years 
to get this properly on the table before 1982. Um, and we have tried in the 30 years since to get it back on the table and Britain is obscurantist, not interested, uh, rejects any discussion, etc. And so the building of a slope, the, what, what in their previous government was called the, um, uh, the uh, Campagna de Cortesia, uh, uh, the courtesy campaign, which, uh, the which under... Charm offensive. Charm offensive. That's charm offensive, exactly. Under Ditella, that, of course, and others, and that, of course, didn't give the results. They did have this one defector, if that's the word that's currently used, that, that, that went to Buenos Aires recently and, and agreed, but one is not 2,300, uh, and is, I think, not the beginning of a trend, as I'm sure you would agree. But I think that their view is that that's not the root. The root of, uh, if, if we can succeed more through pressure, then we'll we can possibly in the long run get even better results that will come with an offer at the end, perhaps after a good deal of time has passed and we've gone to the wall, as it were, on this. Um, but I don't think that they feel, since they don't accept the legitimacy of the argument, the Falklanders, from their perspective, are an imported people. Uh, they don't listen when you say, yes, but I'm imported 180 years ago. Um, and they all want to remain British. Uh, this is very hard for them. They feel that they're not getting anywhere and that the, the way they've now got a few positive irons in the fire, those are working well and they're much more likely to get something. If only British embarrassment, uh, they're, much more, they're much more likely to get something from this hard-nosed policy than on a soft nose, whether they're right. Yeah, despite these 17 public intellectuals raising the head above the parapet, isn't it a bit strong to describe Argentina's democracy is flourishing. It's certainly not accountable in our sense of the word. And um, I, I look, just taking the manipulation of statistics by Christina Kirshner, which she followed on from her equally manipulative husband, Nestor Kirshner, um, the inflation statistics just to start with, um, and the persecution actually of journalists, uh, business and commercial and economic journalists, who actually were trying to point out these figures were totally fallacious. Certainly, miss the Argentines don't believe them. How could they? I mean, the uh, inflation rate is running at twice what the government's saying it's running at. We actually had the unprecedented situation three weeks ago where The Economist uh, said it was refusing to publish Argentina's um, uh, inflation statistics. I mean, they could be uh, up for the Booker Prize, but uh, as fiction. And it was refusing to publish them. And it actually had an editorial uh, on precisely why. And actually, Make, having made that point, can I go on to the more important point, which I think is in terms of the long-term future and why this may not be, uh, despite our provocative view of sending Prince William down there, why this may not be actually on the table for long, and that's the looming economic crisis in Argentina. Um, I mean, we, okay, fair enough, I accept that Christina won her landline, uh, landslide victory, but that was only after sort of sacking the governor of the National Bank, raiding the pension funds, etc., etc. Certainly. Uh, most economists I know of, and those who are experts on, the, on South America, reckon that it's just a matter of time before the, basically the Argentine economy goes pear-shaped yet again. Very good. Um, I would say that, uh, I would quote Ernesto Lopez, I don't know, he's actually an Argentine diplomat, I suppose I shouldn't be quoting him, but uh, he uh, is, a, is a political scientist, and every time that everyone attacks Correa or attacks Chavez, or attacks um, Ortega as, as uh, uh, dictatorships, he replies with one phrase, en comparación con qué, or relativo a qué. Yes, I completely agree in terms of Sweden, Britain, Canada, this, there's a lot of, lot of room for improvement, uh, to say the least, in Argentina. But in comparison to what Argentina has been, this is Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and so uh, I, I didn't want to be hard on the, on the Argentines. Flourishing is always relative to, is it winter or summer, I guess. And, uh, and I think it's a very nice spring in, in Argentine um, uh, parlance or in, in the Argentine case, but we're a long way from all the flowers being where they should be in, in terms of development. The looming economic crisis, my only thought on that is that it's probably not a very good one, is that uh, 
Looming economic crisis doesn't mean they'll be less uh, anxious uh, to stir trouble. It might mean that they would be more anxious to stir trouble merely because it's still good for them, as we learned in 82, as every country, it's not any, that any country escapes exporting problems and saying it's all someone else's fault. Uh, but certainly, the Argentine governments have been particularly good yeah, at that. Yeah, they'll be more consumed with their domestic problems. They would be. They would be. I, I just, I'm not sure the diplomats would, though, and I, I would suspect that that would not slow them very much on that issue, unless they became dependent, unless the, what the solution is, or what's perceived as a solution, required them to pass through London towards Brussels, uh, or even Washington, because Washington may not be what it used to be, but IMF, the World Bank, etc., it still has tremendous clout. Yes, Lawrence. Oh, thanks very much for that. And picking up on your uh, seasonal theme, um, if I was to describe where the Argentine government was right now, it certainly wouldn't be spring. It would be late summer, early autumn. And the reason for that, I think, is that we're looking at midterm elections next year only. And then, in practical terms, Christina, unless she finds a way to get re-elected or find some kind of Putin-type arrangement with a prime ministerial post, and it's effectively a dead duck for the next two years. What we have at the moment is an Argentine government absolutely at the peak of its power. It can only go down. It's got nowhere else to go. It's got practically one year to do what it wants to do. We have that at the same time we have a president who personally has a very, very strong connection to territorial issues, who largely built her political career around another set of ter territorial issues in the South. That's where she got a national profile from. It's very well versed in this stuff, understands the political dynamics that surround it. Then we have the splits in the Peronist movement. Nationalism, the Falklands in Peronism has always been absolutely crucial. This is a way for Christina to build bridges to parts of Peronism that perhaps were ruined during the election campaign. So we've got a number of different factors going in on internally there. I'd like to pick up again this point about the 13 intellectuals that uh, both of these gentlemen uh, picked up. I think one of the interesting points about that, and probably more important things about it, is, was the reaction after that. You said quite rightly that there's a huge amount of diverse opinion in Argentina about this issue, which I absolutely agree with. However, my impression, I've been in Buenos Aires for the last month, my impression is you can say anything you want as long as you agree at the end of the day that Malvinas is Argentine. So any sort of strategy, any sort of theorizing around that is fine, and I've seen a whole variety of different types of thinking around that, from national development to kind of ethical questions of the law. However, if you say publicly that you think there's a question over that, you will be attacked. And this group of intellectuals, who I might add is not just any group of intellectuals, but Beatrice Sarlo, Luis Alberto Romero, and we talk well-respected internationally Argentine intellectuals. As soon as it was made public, they were going to make this statement, release this document, people closely linked to the government attacked them ferociously, calling them traitors, basically accusing them of not being real intellectuals, not being real academics or thinkers. That tells me that the government is very well aware that it has a short window in which to push this particular issue. As you suggested yourself, this is not something that can run on for many, many years, that they are aware that there is some kind of urgency to try and push it forward. I don't believe that they believe that they're actually going to make what I would call substantive progress. But what I do believe is that for Christine personally, and for a lot of the people in the parents' movement, one of the marks of success of this government will be able to say, we got something, however small it is. It doesn't matter what it is. If they get a reaction from the UK, if they get some sort of support, which frankly, from Latin American countries, those countries that would be the most vociferous are the ones with least influence. The ones with the most influence, which in this case would really be Brazil, We'll be thinking, amongst other things, yeah, we've got a big relationship economically with Argentina, but actually, you know what, in the long run, we'd really like to get on the UN Security Council. Who do we want to piss off, first Argentina or Britain? Well, I'll tell you what, sorry, guys. So there are a whole number of things coming together here, but my, my own view is that this will run probably until, at this level, until the midterm elections next year. We've got a whole year in which they can hold up the symbolism of the 30th anniversary, and then at the 180th anniversary, then we've got the midterm elections. After that, whatever happens, Christina's power is going to be diminished. 
So some of the political dynamics inside Argentina are going to change quite profoundly, whatever. And I think that will be when we'll see actually this dropping back down the agenda. Um, probably I'll be criticised for that, uh, that view, but I just don't see it as being something that's got legs to go on and on and on for the next five years, the way it is at the moment. Unless, of course, David Cameron persists in making bloody stupid comments. <laughs> 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 But I can't imagine the latter option is a real one. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think you're uh, bang on on many, many points uh, there, and you raised quite a few that are that are really very important. Um, I remember in La Nación, uh, after Cristina's latest triumph, um, they had a uh, a picture of of her receiving the throng's approval and everyone cheering, etc. And right below her is sort of uh, Obama looking up at her. And on the other side of her podium, there's uh, Sarkozy looking up at her. And, uh, and both of them in the little bubble are saying, no, no, senora, we don't want to know uh, how, you, uh, how you tackle elections. We want to know how you get an opposition like you've got. <laughs> and uh, and it's it, I think you're right about I think all of what you've said is right and I think probably the solidarity uh, issue will be the problem that will come up first whether it has the sticking power uh, to continue it is of course in the interest of a number of countries that it should um, as long as the price isn't high if the price becomes high then it's not in the interests of many it is very nice, lots of people like, even the Chileans have privately said, we actually have a big issue that's capturing headlines on which we're showing solidarity. Privately, we wish it never occurred, but it's something where, look, people have actually noticed that the UNASUR is taking a position on something, whereas normally, uh, no, one, uh, no one notices. Um, the, the other side, I think, which will act in, against some of the things that uh, I was suggesting, at least limit it to some degree, is this is legitimate while, it's, while it lasts. Um, if you're going to start screwing up significantly, it doesn't matter about the OAS. Yes, it's inconvenient, but the OAS isn't doing anything. Uh, so if you are uh, putting spokes in the wheels of OAS progress, the bicycle's already stopped. Um, it would be more problematic if uh, EU Latin America or an EU South and an EU UNASUR, things where all the partners of Great Britain were hearing was this constant harping on an issue which nobody wants to hear very much about. It's a, and in many ways it rather sounds like poor old Cuban dip diplomats who always have to produce this first 40 minutes of uh, perhaps true uh, complaint about the Americans on everything before they go to the issue that's on the table and by then they've lost the audience. Uh, I think the Argentines would be in that kind of danger if they uh, if, if they press too far. At the same time, they're having fun at the moment. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to just take um, three questions uh, together and then we can wrap up uh, with the answers if that's all right. Um, yes, over here one, um, please. Uh, how do you do? Thank you very much. My name is Martin London. I'm, I'm from the Foreign Office, and it's uh, my privilege and pleasure to have responsibility for the Falklands in the uh, in the MC, along with other territories. Um, <coughs> I think that I might um, ask about really the sort of the characterization and title of, the, of, of your uh, very helpful presentation, where you characterize it as a crisis. Uh, and I wonder whether it is a crisis in any meaningful sense of the world, actually. actually. I mean, I think we tend to view it as a, as a, as a, as a new reality that we simply have to deal with at the moment, and it's very regrettable, and, and, and it's a huge opportunity cost, and it's an irritation, of course, but I think, you know, in 1982, one of the things that Argentina did was it, 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 it hopefully misread the British response. Um, it didn't really anticipate that task force would sail and that there would be a commitment, and, and it's kind of understandable, I suppose, that, 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 that they misread it that way. Um, but I think there's a lot that they're sort of misreading the British response now, and I think that's probably less excusable. And of course you can criticize the Prime Minister as the British did not that. But um, nobody who has uh, perceived this issue um, objectively could really have any doubts about the sense which this British government and indeed the body politic more broadly 
uh, committed to the Falkland Islanders. And I think it's going to get, it's going to be difficult. You're right to, to debunk the militarization stuff. Uh, and, and I think there's too much silly talk. And, you know, when I read Daily Mail uh, and, it, and its depiction of the reality in the South Atlantic, it's not one I recognize in my day-to-day uh, -day business. And you, know, you go back to Dauntless, which is already steaming down, possibly with Prince William on board. And so you know Dauntless is still merrily sitting in, um, in Portsmouth uh, Um So I think there's a, there's a big disconnect between the facts and the reality. But I would just make this one point, which is that it, it's not quite innocent fun, and it's not quite just rhetoric, um, because you've seen a whole series of Argentine measures, economic measures, certainly not military, that have made life much more difficult for the Falkland Islands over the last couple of months. And like someone's just come back from the islands and tells me uh, cauliflowers were about £10 each, I think. £10.50 uh, for a cauliflower, and that's a very real manifestation of some of that angst and, uh, and difficulty. And I think the British government, actually, um, whilst wanting a productive relationship with Argentina, wanting to go back to the 90s and the sovereignty umbrella that, that, that you mentioned, is not going to be shy about pointing out these measures. It's not going to be shy about enlisting EU support and other allies to point out not about our sovereignty claim, because that's a bilateral issue and you, know, you can deal with that, but about Argentine misbehavior more broadly, which I think will have consequences for Argentina's uh, place in the world and its relationships with others. And those of you who saw uh, the Argentine NFA statement today criticizing the EU trade votes for telling lies, is that the harbinger of, of, of what's to come? Something that really unfortunate if it is. Um, one last thought, I'm sorry for me to, to hold this. Um, the other big difference about 1982 and now is, is the Falkland Islands themselves. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s, they were really dependent upon the UK. They were struggling with their economic fortunes. 30 years later, it's a very different uh, reality. Um, they not only balance their books, uh, but they have a budget surplus. What uh, Western democracy wouldn't hope for uh, that. So I think you can be tremendously optimistic. But Argentine behavior is, I'm afraid, more worrying than them. Um, uh, than perhaps some might initially assume. Right. Um, I think there's another couple of hands at the back. Yes, Douglas. Just uh, I suggest that there's a certain irony about uh, that situation that, to use your phrase, Argentina is a country of imported people which exists because of self determination. And the Falklands is a country of imported people that is seeking self determination. Mm -hmm. The second point I would make more seriously, perhaps, is that I think it's very easy in Europe to underestimate the symbolism of the Falklands in Argentine political culture, with a certain fragility and predisposition to disagree on those issues. This is the one issue on all of Argentines agree, there's no, no dispute. And any, any policy has to be formulated with that in mind. A last question. No one? One more? You have already spoken yeah. about that, but if no one else is going to put up their hand, over to you. I'll be extremely brief, but I thought that the challenge came um, from several of the speakers uh, to uh, listen to you, but to think about what's happening here has been extremely uh, therapeutic. Um, anyone who read the front page story of the Times on Monday must have been astonished to read that the 77-year-old commander of the Marines in 1982 was making a statement which was quite shocking, really, for um, regular readers of the British press. It was virtually um, an invitation, if one read it um, naively, uh, to think that um, the Argentine could take the Falklands merely by taking um, the, the airstrip. Now, what I've been hearing when I heard the invitation to think about Cameron what I heard from you uh, speaking um, with uh, your own, but also your institutional perspective, reminds me that we have been convinced by successive governments since 1982 and by the British military that we ought to have a Falklands level or style capacity. That's how I read that extremely clever piece of manipulation of European and British thinking on Monday by a very wily old fox. I think that um, it's going to cost us a lot of money if we think that we could ever have 
such a Falklands style or level capacity ever again. But in these days of intervention on the part of the United Kingdom and other parts of the world, it doesn't come as that much of a surprise. Although I must admit, I was initially naive on Monday morning. By Tuesday, I decided how I ought to read that clever piece of journalism. I'll well, over to Hal to uh, final thoughts. Uh, okay. We have quite a lot to comment on that. Um, I guess I didn't do my job very well if I left the impression that I still thought it was a crisis. I was trying to suggest that, that to use your word, that that was a new reality. Um, uh, I face the same Daily Mails and the same Nacion and Clarín that, that you do each morning, and uh, I'm forced to deal with the press and everybody else using this, this word. But I don't think it's a crisis because if the, op if the military option isn't there, then a great deal of the idea of crisis uh, goes out uh, goes out the window. You might discuss it as a diplomatic <coughs> problem. Um, so I certainly would agree with you uh, there. And I also agree that uh, Argentine, again, I'm coming back to the point on legitimacy, uh, a la longue, this can't be something that the Argentines want to take to every table, because there are tables at which they want important things speaking to German chancellors and to the EU in particular, and even to the United States, which doesn't like big problems in the, in, in the South, and although it's not as decisive as it used to be, it's still, it's still there. But I cannot say other than speaking to their defense ministry daily and going for drinks with them and the rest of it, they're willing to take the risk. Uh, and it is distressing to see that they are willing um, to take the risk. Uh, your point on the changes in the Falkland Islands is, of course, bang on. Um, uh, of course, that's from an Argentine perspective, they can also trout that out as a victory. Look, we're scaring off investment. Look, we're, we're, we, they are suffering, these people who are imported and are not a, r a real nation. And how can you talk about self-determination for 2,300 people? All the arguments that are, that are trotted out, which do have some legitimacy. You know, we haven't talked about 2,300 except in where is it, the Pacific, uh, not Pitcairn, but uh, wherever. It's still a very low figure, and of course they're imported, but as you point out, who ain't imported uh, in, in the Americas? I guess the difference they would say on that issue is that um, uh, these are seized, that of course Argentine, Argentinians didn't conquer anybody, forget the desert campaign, uh, that Argentinians didn't conquer anybody, that we arrived on our own free will, blah, 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 blah. But, um, but I, the point is, is well taken. Um, there is, of course, like all of Latin America, and I guess maybe all of us, but particularly in Latin America, there is the question of blaming someone else. Um, it, I think what uh, not Oppenheimer. Yes, Oppenheimer calls um, uh, El Perfecto Idiota Latinoamericano, that uh, the, no matter what happens, es culpa de otro. Uh, which is in all of us, but it may be in, in, in those who've suffered more or whatever uh, a, a bit more important. I'm always remembered in the American case that the Americans always say that if an if a, uh, Italian comes home after four weeks abroad uh, working like a dog for his family and finds his wife in bed with another man, he takes out a revolver and he shoots the man. If a Frenchman comes home in the same circumstances, he takes out a revolver and shoots the woman. If a German comes back in the same circumstance, he, come, he takes out a revolver and shoots both of them. And if the Swiss, oh, sorry, if the Swede comes back and, and faces the same situation, he shoots himself. Uh, but that if a Latin American uh, comes back from four weeks abroad where he's slave for his family and comes back and finds his wife in, in, uh, in bed with another man, he races down to the United States Embassy and throws rocks. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the Britain is there yet. I'm delighted to, to say, perhaps in Iran, but not, not in Latin America yet. I still think, coming back to Maxine's point, that this is, a, this is a long relationship which perhaps, for all kinds of unfortunate reasons, uh, uh, declines, some of them inevitable perhaps, some of them not, not so inevitable, but that the the good will in Argentina, never mind in the rest of the region towards this country, on all issues, I would say, almost without exception, uh, is remarkable. And its sustainability has been uh, remarkable. And, 
And of course you do want good relations with Argentina, and I wasn't arguing the Argentine case, I hope no one thinks I was arguing the Argentine case. I have a lot of respect for the Falkland Islanders. Um, uh, at the same time, it is unfortunate, to say the least, that, that, that we're that we're, we're in, this, uh, in this situation. So I don't think it's a crisis. I think the tendency to blame someone else is, is going to be around. It's going to be a political football uh, forever and a day, like all these issues are, even the Peruvian-Ecuador border, again, uh, flaring up a tiny bit this week. Uh, these things are very hard to, to put to bed. And of course, this one is connected to oil. <laughs> as soon as that free word, free letter word this time is, is trotted out, you've got, uh, you've got big uh, problems, and uh, I think a lot of the, I, I learned a lot uh, today, so I enjoyed it very much uh, exchanging views. Well, we learned a great deal too, Hal. Thank you uh, very much for an excellent talk, and thanks to all of you who made it so comfortable for us. Um, we are going to have to end now, but thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.